Welcome. My name is Musonda Mumba, and I'm the director for the UNDP Rome Center for Sustainable Development. This is so exciting in this very special series of ACT for SDGs and also Turning Point Dialogue series. We're so excited to have the most special guests for you, but also really wanting to delve deeper into really understanding the complexity and intersectionality of food systems and climate change. Here we are all navigating a pandemic, seeing how this pandemic has shown its face and really manifested in ways that has really shown the actual absence of inclusion. And as we're going to be having the first ever global food system summit. It's absolutely exciting and also sobering at the same time because we are in a moment in history where we are seeing a lot of people going hungry. Not only has this last year shown us how malnutrition has intensified, but also showed us that nearly 600 million people will be suffering and will not be on track to meet the SDG nutrition target. How did we get here? But really what these food systems have also shown is that they're not inclusive and they're also not sustainable. And so really exciting is just to have this dialogue with two amazing women who are going to tell us about how women across the world have borne the brunt of the challenges of degraded ecosystems, pandemics, um, inequality, biodiversity loss, degradation, and how it's really manifested in a really making this pro disproportionate for these communities and for the women and youth in particular. So without further ado, I really would like to introduce two of our amazing speakers who are going to tell us how can we disrupt this system? How can we address some of the challenges that we're facing? Is there hope for us collectively um, as uh, humanity on this planet? Where can we have sustainable finance and where possible energy changes in policies that are gender sensitive? So joining me today, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Her Excellency, the Italian Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and Development Corporation, Marina Sereni. Welcome. And also joining us all the way from Lagos, Nigeria, is the amazing chair of the Secular Economy Innovation Partnership, Didi Noli Erosien. Welcome, Didi. Thank you so much for joining us and very excited. So without further ado, I really would like to come to you, uh, Minister, uh, Vice Minister Sereni. It's been so amazing. You hosted the pre-summit on food systems here in Rome, and it's really amazing to just see how those conversations went along and I know that you've been engaged very directly in just amplifying the voices of elements of inequality and really where you want to see inclusion added. So what do you see as the most pressing of challenges in the food systems as we see them today? Thank you. Thank you, Musonga, for the question. Uh, first of all, in Italy, we consider that more sustainable food systems are central for the whole 2030 agenda. That is why we believe in the UN Food Systems Summit process and why we hosted, as you tell, uh, in Rome, its pre-summit in July. Uh, the most pressing sustainability challenges that food systems are facing include the fact that while food production increases, the increase of land surface for agriculture represents the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and the leading cause of biodiversity loss. Uh, at the same time, climate change is expected to depress yield in regions already plagued by low productivity and food insecurity. Moreover, a growing population is likely to require much more nutritious food, which today, however, is too expensive for millions and millions of citizens. So the Food System Summit process, it is a first step in the right direction. We need to pay attention to the way the value of food is distributed within the value chains. 
the majority of the value is captured by food processing, trade and other services, and too little by the farmers. In addition, gender imbalances in agriculture, nutrition and access to resources, both financial and legal services, as well as natural resources such as land and water, have significant impact on the lack of inclusivity within food systems. Uh, this is the reason why we are completely focused on the summit. We want to have concrete result. results. Absolutely fantastic. And I think you really raise a very valid point on these very resources that are finite and also being, you know, uh, really disregarded. Didi, you specialize in innovation in circular economy, and you are no stranger really to the interconnectivity of these systems and why they matter, but also the cycles of impact. From your perspective, how do you unpack the cause and effect throughout the systems to ensure that we transform them for good? So it's a very interesting question. It's a very important question. And um, from an innovation point of view, a lot of innovation comes from business um, business systems. We've just spoken about food systems. So when you look at the pollution in the world, for example, we know that three great pollutants are cement, plastics, and um, food. <laughs> and, and one big question is, how do you actually transform the way that we do things through innovation? And that's where something like the circular economy is so exciting because it challenges you to ask yourself not just how, what are we doing with natural resources? It also forces you to think through how do we use less of the nature, natural capital that we have? And how do we ensure that in the process of manufacturing, in the process of creating food, in the process of producing cement, in the process of producing packaging for all the goods that we buy, for all the food that we eat, that we're actually generating less waste. Um, and, and of the waste that is generated, how does that become an input to a new cycle? And how do we, even as we take care of the environment, think to ourselves that we've got to impact positively on society, we've got to impact positively on the economy. That means that we're creating new jobs. We're talking about green jobs. We're talking about different types of energy. How do you harness the sun in order to generate power? How do you use plastic bottles? I saw recently a plastic bottle that was put into a ceiling and with, I think just with, with water and it was generating light into a house. How do we architect buildings differently? Why does the toilet have to flush so much water every time you go in? It's a rethink. And so one of the big questions is, how does business as an idea transform society? How do we get business leaders to think differently with a more ethical and a sustainability mindset? How do we take into cognizance as businesses evolve the cultural indigenous in their very ethos, adding value to the society, to the culture, to the economy, um, where they do their business and where they make their profits? And how do we ensure that actually we keep alive the initial intent with which businesses were built, which is very often to solve a problem, to close a gap? And so when we look at business in that way, or when we look even at public governance in that way, or operations at the base of the pyramid, where the communities operate, from a problem-solving mindset, then what happens is we're really bringing innovation to bear in our day-to-day -day lives, and we're living life with a, with a greater consciousness that is also more conscious of placing the human person in the center of all that we do and leveraging technology and all the other kinds of capital and resources that we have to ensure that we're preserving our human dignity, but also the natural ecosystem in which we live. Brilliant. No, thank you very much. Rethinking, finding innovative solutions. I come back to you, um, Marina. What do you think or which are the transformative um, actions that governments need to take, particularly around how to improve access to sustainable finance and pursue gender equality and food security? And 
Since Italy is also the G20 president currently, what do you see as the role of the G20? First of all, to be transformative, any action by government should devote special attention to women. The most uh, powerful engine of transformation are women. Uh, the pandemic crisis has shown once again that past achievements on gender equality are not guaranteed. And while women have been at the forefront of the response of the pandemic, they have also been losing ground on gender equality rights, rolling back the advancement gain. So, first of all, women. Second, uh, catalytic, catalytic investments for food security and nutrition should be increased as part of the substantial COVID-19 emergency fund and recovery packages. All actors of the financial system need to play a role in improving availability and access to finance, especially for smallholder farmers and small and medium enterprises. Uh, the G20 has a key leadership role to play in all this. Under the Italian presidency, we have done our best to keep these issues high on the global agenda. Uh, last June, ministers of both foreign affairs and development cooperation issued the Matera Declaration on Food Security and Food Systems. It's an innovative call to action, uh, and uh, especially considering all the G20 members agreed on it, on, to it. Uh, uh, it was not easy. Uh, the declaration includes commitments on transformative actions together with others aiming to accelerate adaptation of agriculture and food system to climate change, increase social protection and the One Health approach. So I think we have done a piece of our path, we have to continue to go on. Now, this is absolutely impressive and congratulations on the Matera Declaration. I mean, that was really amazing to really put also food systems and the recovery at the center, women as agents of change. And you're right to see that. Didi, same question. What do you see as the transformation that governments need to do in order to pursue sustainable finance and gender equality and food security? So we're in very interesting times at the moment. Um, so first of all, we are already seeing major shifts. First of all, the government's embracing what's happening in the community, which is really what I love about sustainability. It's, it's always very stakeholder engagement oriented. So um, even in the transformation of how reporting is handled and how companies are obliged to account for how they impact, is not just being driven by the companies and by the regulators, but is also being backed very strongly by government, which means that we think, or I believe that we will see much more impact investing, much more responsible and accountable behavior by businesses going forward as they account for their negative impacts and they try to enhance their positive impacts, not just the business itself, but all the way across the value chain and the supply chain, which obviously strongly means women and youth, and that is so critical. Also very specifically on circular economy, what are you doing with the natural resources that you use to produce? And how do you ensure that you're generating less waste and you're actually using fewer human resources? Well, what will really create that change from my perspective? Again, very much an African perspective. I've seen three leapfrogs happen. First of all, if I speak from my country, Nigeria, which is a population of 200 million people, we started about almost 20 years ago now with 400,000 landlines, telephone lines. And we all know how important communications is. Within a decade, we moved to 100 million of those same lines. That was a leap from the event. And it created huge amounts of wealth for so many people. With the fintech revolution, where we had no access to finance for the bottom of the pyramid, no access to finance for micro, small, and medium-scale enterprises. And that began to change when we moved from just brick and mortar banking to fintech. And you've seen fintech really opened the doors for so many people who have been outside of the system. We've seen human agents make money, create jobs, but also take 
financial services to the poorest of the poor in the most re remote locations. My foundation does some of that work and I've witnessed how impactful and powerful that could be. Now, what's gonna be the next thing? If you ask me, I think it is blockchain and smart contracts moving from only banks being able to provide access to financial services to us being able to do peer-to-peer -peer lending. We know that you know, 2,000 people in the world hold the, the wealth of the resources. But a lot of them, I also know, would like to go do good. And sometimes these very big foundations are not able to create the kind of impact that you can on a person-to-person -person or in blockchain language on a peer-to-peer -peer level. So how do we level the playing field so that those who have resources are able to invest in those deserving people who need access to resources and have aspirations for sustainable livelihoods and meaningful, dignified work. This is what I think could really change. Fantastic. Innovation and leapfrogging. That's really exciting. I come to you, uh, Marina. In your one or two words, people watching out there, what would be your call to action? First of all, I, I think that it's important to consider that the, the Food System Summit is a starting point, not an end, an end point. Mm -hmm. That means to progress with the full involvement of all parties and the commitment to carry on all the initiatives emerging as deliverable of the summit. Uh, from this point of view, I would like to stress that the most powerful mechanism of the Food System Summit Dialogues is to have created the, the platform uh, uh, to have offered to people around the world the unique opportunity to share their ideas. I have heard the interesting ideas of uh, uh, Didi uh, to, to propose solutions, partnerships, action plans in line with the multi-stakeholder multi and inclusive approach of the summit. We have to build coalitions on these points. We have to create the condition to have multi-actors uh, uh, plans all together united. And I also think that the future collective actions should be guided by the final key message of the pre-summit. Uh, when Amina Mohammed said, no, no, there is no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. That's a, a cultural approach we have to keep in mind which also characterized the Italian agri-food model, for instance, inspired by the principles of sustainability and full respect of local culture and traditional food production. Fantastic. Didi, what would be your call to action for anyone watching out there? Um, first of all, I would say technology-enabled human connection. I think sometimes we take technology for itself. I think blockchain has huge opportunities there. Um, and technology just allows us to scale everything that we're doing. The second is indigenous knowledge. Um, we need to be able to tap into the wisdom of wealth and knowledge and insight that we have across so many different cultures. And I noticed that especially from where we come, from the African continent, it's a huge opportunity because we are having to rethink everything. Um, and that rethink. And these disruptions that happen, one of the most fascinating things for me over the last year has been our blue skies. We suddenly saw blue skies in places where they've been gray. And that's because we were challenged to do things differently, radically differently. And perhaps the last is really just to end with, you know, the beautiful, bright coloring of the sustainable development goals. I think that rainbow is not for nothing. And, and it's just such a powerful language that has brought the whole world together. The sustainable development goals are multi-stakeholder, multinational, global challenges. And what's really exciting about the current progress that we're making, at least on the Nigerian side, is that we're beginning to dig deeper than the sustainable development goals into the different indicators. And what will be really exciting is if we're able to really begin to measure the impact using common standards 
across the different businesses, the governments, the different stakeholders, as well as civil society, to ensure that we're really generating a common impact and a common outcome that we can all own and that leaves no one behind. Brilliant. No, thank you so much. We're now coming to the end of our conversation. And I know that both of you have been inspired one way or the other, either by a person, by a book, by a project, maybe music or even a piece of art. Uh, Marina, what really has inspired you to be, to be on this journey? Oh, it's a very difficult question. Uh, I must admit that in my uh, career, uh, I, have, I have been inspired by many mentors and many, uh, many different uh, books and so on. But since we are here to turn things around towards the achievement of the 2030 Agenda, Perhaps it's good to mention the Pope, Pope Francis and his encyclical uh, Laudato Si on the care of our common house, home. Uh, I believe that this document inspired uh, many leaders and many people around the world, independently from their political or religious uh, uh, beliefs, uh, to rethink the way we conceive the production, the consumption, the relation uh, human uh, beings and nature, the nexus human nature. And so I think it's uh, quite an inspiring uh, uh, lecture. Absolutely. Didi, what has inspired you to be on this journey? It's interesting because Marina... Um inspires me to to think back to to my PhD and laborum existence and you know just everything about Catholic social theology and the dignity of human work um I, I've just just always been so deep but what I actually wanted to say was um a very simple answer probably much too humble but um I'm inspired I have two daughters um they're 25 and 23 and you know they just cause me every single day to to rethink and reconsider how I engage and how I embrace the world, how I communicate the languages in which I, I, I choose to identify or, or connect. And I think it's so important that as part of this circularity that we're unfurling, that the intergenerational dialogue is such an important component of, of what we're doing now, especially, you know, from an African continent point of view, where 60% of our demography is, is really, um, and, and growing every day is really under the age of, of 35. And, and so if we don't understand the language of our young people, we who still have so much access and so much power and so much capital and so much more than they do how can we help shape the future that we want how can we help shape the future that we need if we don't bridge that gap um, between the generations so that really just it, it keeps me inspired and it keeps me on my toes every day fantastic well i want to thank you both so very much for being a part of this amazing dialogue for those of you joining us out there please do connect with us on for act for sdgs.org and really register for action and be a part of this conversation thank you